We are today beginning uh, the third week of the fast already. You know, it's like this fast has really gone fast. Sorry, I should have had my... Let me try that again and pretend these are sunglasses. You know, this fast has really gone fast. What's that TV show? I'm not very good at it. Anybody know I'm the David Caruso imitation? Sorry, I'll work on that and try it again next week. <laughs> um, and I'm going to work a, uh, here in just a minute, as a matter of fact, a, a little bit of an update on mom. I know some of you are expecting that and asking about it. Uh, but I was thinking this week about how many of you have been lifting up mom in prayer and Izzy as well. And uh, thank God for the good reports on both of those. And uh, got calls uh, in the last couple of days from Doug Jones uh, and Pastor Hagen down in Tulsa. I think Lynette called uh, Lori or somebody the other day just letting us know they're praying. And that's what a blessing that is. And if you are on the receiving end of that, if you're in need of prayer or a family member is, you know what a blessing it is just to get a text saying, I want you to know my family and I are praying for you, just prayed for you, anything like that. Uh, or just, and it doesn't matter how how casual it is. It's just a comfort to know that I'm surrounded by people, that I'm part of a church, an expression the local, of the local body uh, of Jesus Christ that cares for me, my family, my mother, and that I can depend on you to be praying. Uh, I was just meditating on that. I didn't even go down the road that I often do, even from the, the pulpit, And here I go, just a couple steps down that road, uh, where I'm doing a lot of eye rolling uh, at people who say, I really don't need a church. You don't need a church to to be a Christian. Does anybody ever have those conversations? I know you do. You're you're meeting somebody or you're talking to somebody, and and, uh, they say something that maybe opens the door a little bit for a spiritual conversation. And so you ask them a simple question. Are you a believer? Are you a Christian? Maybe they said something that made you think they were a Christian. And how... I can't tell you how many times this has happened. It's almost like they're anticipating the next question or they feel like they're accused. But instead of saying, yes, I'm a Christian, I became a Christian when I was 20 or 15 or 40 or whatever, the next thing out of their mouth is actually, I don't think I need to go to church in order to have a relationship with God. Who asked you about church? Did I ask you where you went to church? I asked you if you were a believer in Jesus Christ. But it's like they even if they are, or whether they are or aren't, their answer is to defend why they don't go to church. I don't need a church. Well, guess what? Uh, I think the Bible um, clearly teaches that we do need a church. I mean, we are commanded to assemble together. Uh, But I tell you what, I know that I need a church. (laughs) I can't imagine doing this life without a church. And we talk about it all the time. I can't imagine this life without Jesus. How how can they live without Jesus? How can they live without God's love? How can they feel so at home down here when there's so much more up above? Somebody should write a song, right? Keith Green did. But how can they live without a church? How can they live without a church family? And it's moments and times like this uh, that that really uh, becomes obvious. But uh, just real quickly, uh, mom is doing better. Uh, much better. I, I was being as uh, candid as I, as I felt comfortable being in the emails to you. If you got the emails, you're kind of caught up. They did complete a scan. I don't know how many details I should really share about that, Lisa. Is it anything that's in them? They did, they did find evidence. They, they tried to do an MRI the other day, uh, but she was so agitated, they, didn't get, they did, weren't able to complete it. But she was experiencing some problems with her vision uh, that alarmed the doctor enough to insist that they do another MRI. But in this MRI, they did discover evidence of a brain bleed and evidence of a couple of small strokes. Now, those are kind of separate issues, and they're treated differently. You know, with with strokes sometimes, any sort of uh, blockage or clotting, they they want to do blood thinners. They're not comfortable doing that with evidence of a brain bleed, so they're trying to balance out the treatment options. Uh, I just want you to know from what we have seen as her family, uh, she is in way better condition than she was 36 hours ago or whatever it was. I mean, it's, I cannot stress to you 
how uncomfortable it was to see the state she was in. Uh, and, and, and there is, we can't say with 100% certainty, but it does look like they had given her a, a particular, something to knock her out during the angiogram, and then they administered uh, fentanyl to relax her for the MRI, and there was a bad, bad reaction to that combination. Uh, but once that was out of her system, it's like, wow, she was in her right mind again, and it was uh, a blessing to see. And she's able to converse. She was, she was clearly, you know, but, but at the same time, she's still experiencing some things like maybe some spots in her vision and, and not full on. She's, you know, she might see a pattern on wallpaper that's not really a pattern, but she's not seeing giraffes in her room or anything like that. She's not having full on hallucinations. It's just not, she's not manifestly where she absolutely needs to be, but we are definitely seeing progress. So just keep Keep her lifted up. We are still believing for a complete manifestation of supernatural healing. But while she's there at the hospital, we're also believing for continued excellent care, wisdom for the doctors, etc. And I don't have any details at all other than what I shared via email as far as Izzy Brown goes. But things, the operation was an absolute success. It did everything they wanted it to do. It's just now, from a, per, from a worldly perspective, leaving God out of the picture, it's simply a waiting game to determine... Uh, what this mass was. So we are believing for a good report there. We are believing that, you know, Izzy uh, and, and her sisters and her dad have had the word deposited in them. They know it. Uh, let's just re let's pray that the Holy Spirit reminds them how important it is to keep speaking that over their situation. And again, what a blessing to be able to come together as a church family and fight this battle with them. But I wanted to uh, start with that because I need a church for many reasons, and you do too. And while fellowship, good teaching, mutual submission, mutual correction, all of those things are important, all those things are necessary, the truly wonderful thing about belonging to a community of believers is I know there are people who have my back who will pray for me and pray with me when I need that. And you have that too. It's, uh, it's another uh, reminder of why I believe small groups are super important because the more intimate those connections are, the more fervently we'll, we'll pray and we'll, I'll show you where that, uh, why that is important scripturally here at the end of this sermon in about five minutes. No, not quite that short, but I, I was blessed particularly, well, let, let, me, let me share this first. Might, might as well start with the scripture. How's that sound? Uh, I'm going to share three or four scriptures with you, and the last two or three, I'm draw there's a straight line, but there's kind of a curved line to the one I start with. But real quickly, and we'll be starting in Genesis chapter 20, if you want to turn there. Uh, don't have, on purpose, not taking the time to give you all the background of Abraham, but if you've read Genesis, uh, you remember that Abraham was called out of his, his homeland in Ur of the Chaldeans and called to go to a land that God said, I'll show you when you get there. He pointed the direction, sent Abraham, Abraham and his family, uh, and Lot went with him. And they, they come to this land, and God shows him. And, and through a series of uh, communications and visions and dreams, shows him that this is the land I'm giving you. As far as you can walk, as far as you can see, wherever you tread your foot, this is the land I'm going to give to you and your descendants. And this was important because Abraham was already 70 years old when he left Ur. Uh, Sarah was 60, no, 70 and 80, yeah, yes, uh, yeah, 70 and 60 when they left. And then they, uh, uh, they had no children. And God, they get over there to where they're going, and God says, I'm going to give this land to you and your descendants. Descendants? What descendants? A little late to get started on descendants, isn't it? He didn't know late. It was another 20 years uh, before the manifestation of this. But in between, some interesting things happened. Uh, it, it's a great story. Genesis is a great book to read, man. There's, and you've got to remember, when you're reading Genesis, you're reading, if you divide the Bible up into the years of human history, you know, if you divide it up into 2,000-year periods, First 2,000 years is in that first 50 chapter, that first book of Genesis. And then the bulk of the Bible is the next 2,000 years. Uh, and then we've been living in the last 2,000 years. So a uh, lot of history, a lot of good stuff. But here's, we pick it up in, in 20, uh, and uh, this is after Sodom and Gomorrah. 
which, which is probably familiar to you. If you're not familiar, go back and read. It doesn't take you long to read up to, to the 20th chapter of Genesis, but we'll pick it up in Genesis 20, verse 1. And it says this, And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of, his, uh, of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. This is an odd thing, but Sarah was a beautiful, beautiful woman, even though she's 90, 80 or 90 at this point. Did I have my ages wrong? Maybe he was, he was 80 when they left. At, at, at any rate, Abraham is in his 90s. Sarah's uh, in her uh, 80s, I think, at this point. But she's a beautiful woman, and they're going into this strange land, and, and Abraham's thinking, anybody who sees her is going to want to kill me so they can marry my 80-year-old wife. And so he lies and says, she's my sister. And it wasn't a total lie because they were kind of, re they were kind of related. Uh, but uh, so Abimelech says, well, if that's your sister, I'll, I'll take her as part of my harem. And so he does. And by the way, a little plug for reading the Bible. I have my sister Lori to thank for uh, pointing this out to me. She's doing a, I won't call it a speed reading, but they call it a, uh, a what's it called? A quick scan. The Bible reading plan is just to read it. Uh, and I've tried doing that before. I, I invariably get stuck on a verse and I have to get out another translation. I've tried many times. I'm, I'm going to take the Message Bible and just read it over the next month and just read it through. No study, no nothing. I can't do it. I, I'll, I'll find something in the message. I'm like, what's that really say? And I have to get a real Bible out and compare it and do the whole parallel thing. And, and message is a good, good translation. It's not a good study Bible. But you know what I mean? But if you read it through, if you just read it, you'll notice things that you haven't noticed before because certain names will pop up. It's like, wait a second, didn't I just read that name back here? Whereas if you wait a month, you might not remember that name. And one of those names is Abimelech. Is this the same Abimelech? Turns out, and I didn't know this till recently, that Abimelech is essentially a word like Pharaoh or Caesar. It's kind of a name, kind of a title, but there was more than one Abimelech. He was sort of the Abimelech, all right? So anyway, here's Abimelech, this particular Abimelech takes Sarah as his wife. Verse 3, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and he said to him, indeed, you are a dead man <laughs> because of the woman whom you have taken, uh, for she is a man's wife. I always throw this in there. I don't think I can, I can read this verse without throwing that, this little observation in there. How often we pray for a clear revelation from God. And you know, it's like, yes, we want him to open our eyes as we study. Yes, we want him to just sort of speak to the inner man. But what would be better than hearing God's audible voice? Well, I'd rather not hear God's audible voice if what I'm going to hear is what Abimelech heard. Behold, you are a dead man. Whoa, 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 whoa. What, what, what's happening? Well, you've taken another man. To, uh, who, you've taken another man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Wow. So then you can read this confrontation, this, this conversation that Abimelech has with Abraham. And we pick it up in verse 17. So Abraham prayed to God. And God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children. For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, isn't that interesting? For 20 years, Abraham has, and Sarah have been waiting on the fulfillment of a promise. They even tried to take it into, into their own hands and try to solve this thing with uh, uh, Sarah's maid, Hagar, and, and Ishmael was the result. And we're still, still dealing with the fallout of that today. Uh, but... Now, here it is, 20 years, and God has, has made it clear to them by this point, this is going to be your flesh and blood. You and Sarah together are going to have a biological child. Then we have this Abimelech episode. Abraham prays for Abimelech's household, and what does God heal Abimelech's household of? Infertility. And the women in Abimelech and Gerar begin to have children. Very next verse, Genesis 21, chapter uh, 
chapter, uh, Genesis 21, verse 1, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. I love this. It's a beautiful picture of sowing and reaping. I am going to pray for you. I'm not just going to pray for you, but what I'm praying for you happens to be something that I myself need. And when I pray from my heart on the word for you, what will happen? What happened when Abraham did this? He got what he was believing for. And this kind of hit me the other day. Uh, when I was uh, sitting with mom in the hospital overnight the other night, got a text from uh, one of the, several messages, got some emails, got some texts, but Jenny Good sent me a, very, a long, detailed text. Uh, sorry, I'm not trying to draw attention to you or anything like that, but, uh, but I appreciated it so much. And I appreciate, I really do appreciate all of them. I understand, man. Sometimes you're driving and you say you can only do a short text. Don't text and drive. Uh, but I, I appreciated this so much because she told me what she was praying what she was standing on. She expressed, uh, there was a, a message of encouragement. This from a woman who we've been praying for for years, for healing. Do you know how easy it would be? Because I've been there, not for that long, but I've been there. It's like, I'll get around to praying for you when my own mess is done. When I feel better, I'll pray for your healing. Well, when I'm out of a financial hole, I'll pray for your, your, your uh, prosperity. All these things, I feel like I, I'm too covered up in my own need right now to waste any of my faith on you. Has anybody ever felt a little bit like that? I haven't made it a doctrinal position. I have just found myself feeling that way from time to time. And apparently, I'm the only one. I would appreciate some of you to at least lie uh, as, a, as a show of solidarity. No, I'm kidding. But I appreciated that so much. Here she is, fervently praying for... for for me, my sisters, and for my mom's healing in the middle of fighting this battle herself. And I'm encouraged when I see people doing that from the heart. It's not like, oh God, I'm going to pray for so-and-so, so you better heal me too. And no, no, it's just a matter of recognizing that we serve a God of abundance. I've said this before, God doesn't do triage. Ah, I would love to answer your prayer, but we've got some other, there's so many things that it's already a big drain on my resources, so I got to do this first before I attend to you. No, he loves us all, and his power is unlimited, his supply is unlimited, amen? We believe him, we pray in faith, and we receive. Now, uh, so again, it's like you reap what you sow. Keep that in mind while we go to our next passage, and this one's very familiar. In James chapter 5. Beginning in verse 13, we read, Is any among, anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Here's the part I really want you to see. I just want you to see it in context. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain over the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. This is something that you ought to have memorized, you ought to have highlighted. The, the effectual, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then gives a rock-solid example from Scripture. Elijah wasn't an angel. Elijah wasn't a member of the Trinity. He was a man with a nature like ours. And look what his prayers accomplished. What will your prayers accomplish? So let me break it down really quickly because I'm not doing a full teaching on this. We've talked about it before. What is effective prayer or effectual prayer? It is prayer that is prayed the way Scripture tells us to pray. I don't like to get formulaic about this. God has heard and continues to hear inelegantly expressed prayer. He hears prayers of desperation. But Jesus told us how to pray. He taught us how to pray. And what is scriptural prayer? Scriptural prayer, effective prayer, is prayer that is addressed to the Father in the name of the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make you understand? We address our, we pray to God. We, we take our, make our requests known to God. What enables us to do this? How do we have? We talked about that during communion. The only reason we can take our request to God, make our request known to him, is because of the blood of Jesus. So it's in his name. 
in Jesus' name isn't the magic phrase that activates your prayer. It's acknowledging that I'm only able to approach God in the name of Jesus because of his shed blood. And faith that is empowered, a prayer that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, act, Spirit-filled, Spirit-led prayer. He lays these prayers on our heart. And this is one of the things that we see, one of the importances, uh, importance of praying in the Spirit, as Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I know I'm kind of rushing, but two, two more scriptures I want to look at, and we'll tie these things together. But that's, that's the effective prayer. Fervent prayer is prayer with what's what we've already been talking about. Not just saying the words, but putting yourself in the shoes of the person you're praying for, doing, letting the Spirit, and the only, Spirit can, only the Holy Spirit can really work this in you, bring you to a place where you want it for the person you're praying for as much as you want something for yourself, as much as they want it, as much as they need it. They need this, Lord. I feel that need. I express this need, and i standing on your word, speaking this into their life. It should mean a lot to us because we are a body. When you hurt, I should hurt. When I hurt, you should hurt. And we should take that pain and turn it into a prayer of faith and deliver it to the Father. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person. This is my favorite part, a righteous man. Well, I know how to pray, and I am fervently desiring this that I'm praying for, for myself, this other person, whatever. But I guess I'm disqualified because I ain't that righteous. Yes, you are positionally you are righteous. That's what the blood of Christ is for. It enables God to see us as righteous because where does he put us when we receive that washing, when we receive the sacrifice of the blood of Christ, what, where does God put us? In Christ. So when we pray and God looks to see who's praying, who does he see? He sees Jesus and he withholds nothing. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, that's us. We know how to pray. We know in what manner to pray fervently, and we have been made righteous. So we fit that description. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter 3, beginning in verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. He's talking about, he's addressing this, people saying, why, haven't, why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Is he really going to come back? He's not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what you should do with that verse? Memorize it. Highlight it. Does God desire that all be saved? It says right there, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Does the Bible say anywhere that all will come to repentance and that none shall perish? Nope. Just tells us what God's will is. There's other people's will involved in that. But God's will, God's desire, is that all come to repentance. And the greatest manifestation of that will is the fact that he hasn't come back yet. He's not leaving us here to suffer. He's not dangling this carrot of his return ahead of us to tease us. He's just waiting until the last possible second, until the last person who can possibly be saved is saved. But we know what his will is concerning salvation. Keeping that in mind, let's look at our last scripture. 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. My favorite scripture on prayer. 1 John 5, 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Wow. That is something you should highlight and memorize (laughs) and keep in mind when you go to God in prayer. This is the confidence we have. That if we ask anything, he hears us. Is that what it says? If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is why we need to know the will of God. We can only be in faith if we know the will of God. Faith begins where the will of God is known. If we know the will of God, we can pray the will of God. And if we pray the will of God, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the things we're asking for. So we pray God's will. What is God's will concerning salvation? He is not willing that anybody, anyone should perish. So when you pray for somebody, pray for their salvation. 
He's not going to save them against their will. And we'll go into this a little more next week because I really do want to wrap this up momentarily. But when you pray for somebody, start with this. Lord, I love this person. You can hold them, picture them in your hand and you raise them up to God. I love this person. More importantly, Lord, I know you love this person. How do I know that? You died to save this person. It's your desire that they be saved. It's my desire that they be saved. It's your expressed will. It's my expressed will. I am speaking uh, in agreement with you and your word. My desires agree with your desires. My will agrees with your will. Send someone across their path. This is something that Brother Hagen taught years ago. I remember the first time I heard him teach it while I was still at school. And I know I'm not saying he invented it, but when he started to preach this, it really caught fire. And a lot of churches, not just Rhema churches, caught this vision for how to pray. Rather than just say, God save them, God save them. What did Jesus say? The fields are ripe under the harvest, therefore pray that the Lord of the harvest send laborers into the harvest. So that's, the, that's the most scriptural way you can pray for the lost. So you say, bring laborers across their path, but don't leave yourself out of the equation. Say, Lord, if I am that laborer, Prepare me, fill my mouth with your words so that I speak to their need, I speak to their heart, that, that you would open doors of conversation, that I would represent you properly before them. So that I can be instrumental. If, if I am the instrument you use to bring them into the kingdom, I am willing. Equip me and, and uh, fill me with everything I need to be that instrument. It's a beautiful thing. And it's so important when we're praying for one another. And praise the worship team, you can be, you can be uh, making your way up here. That when we go to God, praying for whatever, that this uh, power that God has made available to us, it's awesome. There are so many things that God has called us to do and to be. And one of the biggest things were that, that uh, I think one of the most uh, potent statements Jesus made uh, about the church is he said that... Uh, they will know that you're mine because of your love for one another. That's what's going to set you apart in this world. That's what's going to identify you as a follower of me, how much you love one another. And one of the greatest expressions of that love is how we pray for one another. If I love you and I recognize a need in your life, no matter how big or how small, God remind me to speak that over you and pray over you frequently often, regularly, until you see that manifestation in your life. When do I stop praying for healing in my body? Well, I speak it daily. But if I'm fighting something, I'll continue fighting that battle until I'm better. I don't say, well, I'm going to give this three days and then I'm just going to see what happens. I need to be that way with you. As long as you're fighting a battle, I want to be fighting it with you. And I want to celebrate that victory with you, whatever it is. And we need, to, we need to be that way about one another. And again, small groups is a, is a good way of stirring that up in you because we become more intimately acquainted with each other's needs. And uh, we love each other better. It's easier to love somebody when you know them. And we're reminded more frequently. And that, that keeps us on our toes and keeps us praying as we're supposed to. And you can go ahead and stand up as I wrap this up. But he's given us resources, he's given us gifts, personalities, talents, so many ways to bless the world, to share the gospel, uh, and to meaningfully impact the lives of people around us. But, but the, I believe the most important thing he's given us is the covenant that entitles us to pray for them. The best thing I can... It's not the same thing. You say, oh, you can't just pray and do nothing else. Uh, I'd rather you pray and do nothing else than do anything else and not pray. This is not the same thing. When, Jesus, when James writes earlier in his book about... It doesn't do any good if you say, uh, uh, be, at, be at peace, be warmed and filled, and yet notwithstanding you don't do anything to meet their need. That's not what he's talking about. I'm talking about fervent prayer of the righteous effective, fervent prayer of the righteous person. That avails much. You know, I love, you know, missionaries. You get missionary letters, and it's some, they sometimes seem to include a formula, but I take them at their word when they say there are two things you can do. If you want to be a part of what God's doing with us, there are two things you can do. If you can only do one thing, pray for us. I love that. They say, if you can pray for us and financially support us, that's great too. 
let the Lord lead you. And I love that. I think, I, th I think those priorities are absolutely right. We would love your prayers and your financial support. If you only do one, pray for us. God can do a lot more through your prayers than through your, uh, through your wallet. But don't ignore the wallet part either. It's, everything belongs to him. Amen? So we've talked a lot today. We've kicked a lot of doors open and not walked very far into the rooms. But I hope it gets your mind going. I hope it stirs a hunger in you to dig more deeply into these things. Meanwhile, we started where we'll end this sermon, which is with this covenant privilege of prayer. But it starts with the covenant. And what is that covenant based on? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. Why does his blood have to be shed? Because we were all sinners. No matter how manifestly good you are, none of us, none of us are good enough to have unfettered access to the throne of God to deserve heaven when we die. We can't get there on our own. But God wasn't satisfied with saying, well, you're sinful. And it's impossible for you to get back. There was a way back, but he, he had to provide it. And that provision was to take everything that sin brought into our lives, including its punishment, and lay all of that on Jesus. And then the judgment of, of, on sin fell on Jesus at the cross. And what he offers us instead is his righteousness. How do we obtain that? I talked about receiving the gift. The Bible makes that clear too. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I would love nothing more than to end this service by praying with you to make that decision, to receive that gift. And I'm going to invite you up here to let me pray with you in just a few minutes. One more invitation before we open up the altar, is mention the Holy Spirit, that, that effective prayer is directed to God in the name of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. If you know you're saved, and you've heard yourself praying, but you sense, maybe in a way you can express, maybe in a way you can't explain, but that your prayers are powerless, let me ask you, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? The disciples on the day of Pentecost, there is no question among scholars of any stripe that I know of, that they were already born again. They were born again when Jesus breathed on them the breath of life. These were believers. These were saved men and women who were tarrying in the upper room. And the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came upon them and they were filled. And what were they filled with? Exactly what Jesus said they would be filled with. They were not just filled with a what, they were filled with a who. The Holy Spirit who gave them power to be His witnesses. And suddenly, these flawed men and women who were at various times just in the last month variously faithful and dedicated to Jesus were suddenly on fire. They were doing miracles. They were, they, the church grew by thousands in a day. And when they prayed, prayers got answered. Things happened. I want you to be able to pray with that kind of power. But you need to be saved and spirit-filled to do that. So if you desire to give your life to Jesus Christ and receive that free gift of salvation, or if you desire to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's something God has for you. The great Larry Millis always said, Jesus is God's gift to the world. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to the church. And we, need, we need both Jesus and the Holy Spirit to do everything he's called us to do. I'm going to pray and invite you up here. Don't waste any time in coming to answer those uh, calls. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who empowers us to pray. And thank you for the promises that we can stand on as we pray. It's my prayer now. I join that. I, I'm joining, being joined in prayer by every believer in this room. That if there's anybody in this room who has not yet identified as a believer, who has not yet availed themselves of the marvelous gift of eternal life that you offer freely through the blood of your son, that they would come to recognize their need today, that they would come to recognize and seize their opportunity today to accept that free gift in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, for every believer in this room who has struggled with a powerless prayer life and anything else that seems to be lacking of your presence in their life, that they would be filled with your Spirit. If they've received the baptism of the, uh, of the Spirit, Lord, that they would be refilled. But that anybody, any believer who has never received the baptism of the Spirit would experience a burning desire to receive Him, the fullness of your gospel kingdom 
uh, the, king, the gospel of the kingdom and the infilling of the Holy Spirit and grant them the boldness to come and receive that today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you come.